Back on topic, guys. Okay, I am recording. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich and here with me is Rish Outfield. Say hello to the folks at home, Rish. Hello, folks. At home and on the bus. And, and you, sir, on the subway. I see you. I see where your hand is. Oh, man. All right, we're back with the second half of last time's story, the story called Fireflies by a Mr. Uh, let me see if I've got this right. Uh, B.D. Is it Anklevich? Anklevich? How, how do you say this name? This yeah, is... yeah, it's hard to say. Is it Vic or Vich, do you think? Wait, let's do it both ways and that way. Uh... Just in case. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. And B.D., really? His name is B.D.? Oh, like your eyes. Oh, that's bad. Why would he choose that? Well, I would think that those are initials for something longer. Oh, okay. I guess that does make sense. Like Billy Dean Anklevich. Billy D. Anklevich. <laughs> I bet that guy's smooth when he drinks a Colt 45. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so if you... We're not going to recap, right? Just they, people need to have listened to the last episode... We're just going to pick up right where we left off? Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Oh, well then say it, man. If you haven't heard the first half of the story, you probably want to go back and listen to that first. That would be the episode right before this one. You'll want to listen to that first because this is the second part of the interminably long story written by <laughs> Mr. Ankovich. <laughs> so yeah, uh, check that out uh, if you haven't already. And once you have checked it out, you can proceed into the story. I guess we don't really need any more introduction, right? I don't think so. Well, let's give the audience a warning. This is written by B.D. Anklevich. <laughs> I think that should cover it, right? Yeah, this story is uh, the, the kind of story that Rish has made jokes about me for all this time. This is a perfect example of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, more about that in a moment, or in a while. Uh, enjoy the story, folks, if you can. I hope you do. <laughs> if you and, can. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. If they make it that far. <laughs> Fireflies by B. D. Anklevich. Part two. Six. From that day forward, they watched Trevin very carefully as he slept. Somehow, some way, all this stuff was coming from his mind while he slept, from his dreams. Every time there had been an event, it had always ended when Trevin woke up. At first, they were harmless things, because he had no experience with anything else. It was just colors before he was born, blobs of light when he was a newborn, soft round shapes as he grew a little more. And now, children's television nightmares. They didn't know what caused it to happen, though. It didn't happen every night, or even often. There seemed to be months in between bouts, except for the one time when it had happened at nap time and bedtime of the same day. They needed to make sure that it didn't happen again, because it had gotten dangerous. Maybe it wouldn't be dangerous again, but Oscar was inclined to believe that it would only become more dangerous the more Trevin grew, and learned about what dangers were out there in the world. They couldn't prevent him from sleeping, though. Sleeping was as necessary as eating, drinking, and breathing. They just had to watch him and wake him if anything happened as soon as possible. They had to get him to an age of reason, get through this until he was old enough that they could explain to him what was happening and work on ways to keep it from happening again. Otherwise, 
their little darling baby was a very dangerous person indeed. Trevin's crib moved back into their bedroom, and Oscar bought a bunch of air horns and left them all around the house, including one on each of their nightstands. He assumed it would be a quick and easy way to wake Trevin up in a hurry. He tested it out that night, and it certainly worked. The baby was crying in seconds after he blasted the horn. He had hope that this was going to work, and it did for a while. Oscar's arm was completely healed and the stitches removed before the next time one of Trevin's dreams came true. They had banned him from TV after the incident with Muno in an attempt to restrict his apparitions to a more garden variety. It worked this first time, at least. One Friday night late in January, Oscar was deep, deep asleep when Simmy shook him awake. He opened his eyes to find her standing next to the bed, bent over him. He blinked again and again, trying to shake the sleep from his eyes and his head. What is it? he asked. She didn't answer. She just stood up straight and continued looking at him. As the sleep dropped away from him, he realized that something was wrong with Simmy. Her face was wrong. It was soft and lacking in detail, as if it were being seen through one of those pantyhose filters they always put over the lens in old black-and-white Joan Crawford and Catherine Hepburn movies. And the eyes. They weren't spaced right. The nose was larger than it should be. So was the mouth. That was much larger. Oscar's breath stopped and his heart leaped into his throat. He was filled with an intense revulsion that sent shivers down his spine. He was looking at some sort of body snatcher's version of his wife. A shapeshifter disguised as the love of his life. What are you? he hissed, casting his eyes about for a weapon to use against this thing, this not Simmy. He slid away from it on the bed, and his hand, then his butt, fetched up against something. The thing he'd hit groaned and rolled over. It was the real Simmy. And with that, his mind cleared enough to know what was happening. He grabbed the air horn and blasted it straight into the apparition's face. It was enough to ruffle its hair in the wind before it vanished with a yelp that came from both the crib and from Simmy, who was no longer sleeping next to him. Oscar? Simmy said, waking up. Was it a dream? Yeah, he said, standing up and going to the crib to pick up the crying baby. It was horrible. 7. The air horn thing worked pretty well for them. Simmy used it to chase off a giant teddy bear. Oscar used it to dispel a new round of fireflies. After several occurrences, though, they were no closer to understanding what triggered the true dreams. They happened very infrequently, which may have been the worst part about it. Every night, Oscar and Simmy put their son to bed with dread in their hearts. Most nights, it wasn't realized, but that didn't make the dread go away. They got sick more often, and their doctor informed both of them that their blood pressure had gone up considerably. Both of them began putting on weight. For Simmy, the weight seemed to only collect in all the right places, but Oscar had to start sucking in his breath when he did up his pants, and an all-new, unsightly paunch hung over his belt line when he was done. Living under the constant stress of what might happen when they went to bed each night was taking a big toll on the two of them. Their night fears didn't haunt them during the day, though. Despite the fact that they probably should feel resentment and anger toward their child, they did not. Maybe it was just the natural parental feelings of protectiveness and unconditional love. Or maybe it was that Trevin was an extra cute baby. But the daytime with Trevin was all happiness. It was only when the dusk began to descend over the city that the fear and stress settled on them. It was after Oscar had been forced to drive off a blanket monster that was intent on suffocating him in its folds with the air horn that the thought that it was all Trevin's fault first entered his mind. He immediately berated himself for blaming his innocent baby. But, sitting there, panting as his adrenaline slowly settled back to normal levels, he couldn't banish the thought entirely. If Trevin were older, they could talk with him, 
to find out what was going on in his head, in his dreams, when his dream monsters manifested in real life. But he was just a gurgling little ankle biter. He could crawl and cruise and was beginning to take some hesitant steps away from the furniture he was clinging to before falling down hard on his diaper padded butt. But he couldn't talk. He couldn't even say one word, much less string enough together to make a sentence and be truly understood. Sentences were perhaps as far away as two years, and knowing enough words to make those sentences really communicate something was even farther out. Yet, the ability to create monsters out of the ether while he slept was already present and accounted for. The ability to terrorize his parents with the vomit his subconscious spewed forth in the form of dreams and nightmares was already well developed. They had no idea how or why Trevin had this ability. They had no idea how it could be controlled or even if it could. They didn't know whether it would be a lifelong gift or something that would fade as he grew older like Colic does. But Oscar did know one thing. Trevin was the source of this horror, and it was ruining his life. Simmy's too, he supposed. They would be so much better off if they'd never had him. Again, his mind balked. No, that wasn't true. They wouldn't be better off. They might not have this issue to face, but they would be missing so much joy that he brought to their lives, too. The happiness that was so great that it outweighed the misery. He really felt that. And besides, Trevin was his son. It was his duty and his honor to care for him, protect him, and provide him with safety and security. How dare he even entertain thoughts like that? They would be fine carrying on with things as they were. They would be fine carrying on with things as they were. The blanket monsters, giant teddy bears, fireflies, and false simmies all fled at the sound of the air horn. It was working and would continue to for as long as it was necessary. At least, that's what he thought before that day they went to the Golden Gate Aquarium. 8. It was one of those days that he would have remembered forever as one of the best days of his life. Trevin had never been so cute as he was when he was toddling shakily around the dark rooms lined with fish tanks. He was too small to know what was supposed to be neat and what was just ho-hum, so he marveled at everything, from the sharks, octopuses, and dolphins, to the shimmering schools of tropical fish, all the way down to the eels, anemones, and worms. Oscar and Simmy couldn't help but laugh out loud each time Trevin pointed, made a big O shape with his mouth, and loudly shouted, Whoa! And when it was feeding time, he shouted lustily every time one of the bigger fish pounced on a smaller one and devoured it. They felt like the luckiest people in the world to have such a beautiful, happy baby to call their own. Dozens of people stopped them to comment on how cute their little boy was, and those that didn't stop them still smiled and chuckled to themselves when they saw his antics. He was simply darling, irresistibly darling. Once they'd finally seen all the sea creatures, birds, and reptiles the aquarium had to offer, they headed back out to the car, strapped Trevin into his car seat, and headed home to relax for the rest of the afternoon. It was a Saturday, so the traffic was light on the drive home. In no time, they were back in their driveway. Before getting out, Oscar leaned over the center console and kissed Simmy on the forehead. She raised her head and gave him a long, soulful kiss on the mouth. It was the natural response to a day so happy. They were both so content with the family that they had. A beautiful, vivacious wife, a loving, nurturing father, a darling cherub of a child. The two of them separated, opened their doors, and got out of the car, and were knocked to the ground by the flailing tentacle of the enormous creature that had been swimming through the air behind their car. They both hit the ground with a breath-crushing thud and rolled to see the newest nightmare that their perfect little son had conjured from his REM state. 
It wasn't any one thing, but more like a little of all things. Pretty much every creature they'd seen at the aquarium had a piece attached somewhere to this nightmare. From the spiny starfish to the stingrays to the crocodiles. And it was huge. It was at least the size of a house. Its tooth-laden maw was big enough to swallow their entire Audi in one bite. Trevin may not have grown past toddling yet, but his dreams had grown way, way too big for their britches. The pattern that they had worked out over the last several months was to turn to the nightstand at this point, grab the air horn, and blast it to wake Trevin up. But they were outside where there were no horns, and Trevin was still in the car, which would probably protect him from sound enough anyway. Instead, he had to get that car open and shout that baby awake before this behemoth caused some serious damage. Oscar jumped to his feet and raced to the back door of the car, pulling the handle. He found that it did nothing. The door was locked. He tried the front door, and it was locked too. How could that be possible? He'd just come out of the door only seconds before. He turned to ask Simi for the keys when the creature slammed into the large eucalyptus tree in their side yard, ripping it from the ground as effortlessly as a person would pull a weed. The tree crashed down as Oscar flinched and reflexively covered his head to protect it. The tree fell streetward, which was a very good thing for both Oscar and Simi. It was a towering tree and would have crushed either or both of them, whether they covered their heads or not. The tree clipped the neighbor's Lexus as it smashed down, crumpling the trunk and slammed into the earth with enough force to make the ground shake beneath Oscar's feet. He had to move fast or things would only get worse. Simmy, he called. Where are the keys? The car's locked somehow. She looked at him with dazed, unfocused eyes. Her hair, cinched in a tight, neat bun moments earlier, was loose and frazzled, and a trickle of blood ran from her right nostril. He could tell she didn't know what was going on and might not even be able to say who he was. The bump she'd taken from the creature when they'd gotten out of the car must have been much stronger than the one he'd suffered. He ran to her side, diving to the ground as a long, spiny, octopus-like tentacle and flapping, stingray-like wing passed through the space he had been occupying. He took her by the shoulders and lifted her into a sitting position. She looked very pale, whiter than he'd ever seen her. Simmy! He looked into her eyes. They didn't seem to be looking back. Where are the keys? You just had them in your hand. Where are they? She was gone. Shock and probably head trauma had rendered her catatonic. He wanted to shake her to snap her out of her trance, but from what he'd heard about concussions on NFL broadcasts, shaking her would only make the problem worse. He needed those smelling salts that he'd seen coaches hold under the noses of dazed players, but of course he had none. He looked up at the creature to make sure it wasn't too close. It didn't even seem to know that they were there. It was merely playing, swimming through the air as if it were water, swirling, cavorting, and dancing. It seemed to have the energy of a happy dolphin at feeding time. As he watched, it knocked over another tree across the street, toppling it into the house it had stood proudly in front of for at least 50 years. Then it turned their way. The creature passed above them, a flipper-like tail batting at the air. Oscar grabbed Simmy and ducked back to the ground. She cried out in pain and rolled to the side, grabbing at her hip. Oscar looked to see what it had been and saw that it was her keychain. She must have landed on it when she fell and, in a fluke, pressed the button on the key fob that locks the door with her body. He snatched the keychain up and jammed his finger on the unlock button. He heard a click from the car next to them and dragged himself to his feet to yank open the back door and wake up his son. Only, he never got that far. Just as his fingers touched the door handle, the creature blasted a flipper through the wall of his garage. Broken chunks of stucco-covered wood rocketed into him, breaking his right leg at the femur, breaking his right elbow, and smashing into the right side of his head. He crumpled with a scream of anguish to the brick driveway. Now it was his turn to float in a daze. It was a panic-filled daze. Somewhere deep in his mind, a voice was hollering that he was supposed to do something, something that would save them all. 
but the voice didn't say what that something was, and Oscar's thoughts couldn't manage to summon it either. They were too occupied with the agony that was coursing through his whole right side where it had been crushed by the flying debris. He moaned and writhed on the ground. No matter how he shifted, he was in immense pain. His ears rang and his vision was foggy. The monster passed over the top of the two of them again. A trailing tentacle snapped out and struck the neighbor's Lexus again, flipping it onto its side with a bang and a crunch. The noise must have triggered something in Simi because she suddenly shook off her daze and rose to her feet screaming hysterically. She ran haphazardly into the street and turned to head northeast up the road. From his position on the driveway, Oscar saw the creature react for the first time to its environment. Simi's scream seemed to draw its attention. It spun in midair and swam back toward her. His fuzzy mind cleared just in time to scream a warning. Simi! No! Then the creature pounced on top of her. Its mouth, an enormous hole lined with rows of teeth and tentacles like a cross between a shark's mouth and the center of a sea anemone, plunged down and closed over her. She disappeared completely. Covered by the creature's maw as it crashed down into the asphalt, leaving a dent of crushed pavement where its head struck. No! Oscar screamed. No! Simmy! No! Please, no! She had simply vanished into the creature's mouth. No biting or chewing. She was engulfed. And she was gone. Gone. Oscar's eyes flooded with tears and he cried out in his grief. Gone. Judging from the cut he'd received on his arm from the orange cactus-leg creature, the damage these dream creatures did while they were around did not reverse itself when they disappeared. So, even if he managed to wake Trevin, it wouldn't bring her back. It had eaten her. She was gone. And so was his reason for living. The creature rose back up off the ground and brought another tree crashing to the ground with a flailing flipper. Oscar's broken right side throbbed with pain, but now he remembered what it was he was supposed to do. Despite the pain that coursed through him when he did it, he dragged himself to the car and pulled the door open. Trevin! he shouted at the top of his lungs. God damn it, Trevin, wake up! The baby cried. The creature disappeared. And Oscar passed into unconsciousness. 9. A neighbor called the police. The police came out and looked at the damage and were baffled. In the end, they told the news crews that it had been a microburst that had swept through the neighborhood. Oscar had never heard of the term microburst before in his life, but apparently it was something similar to a localized tornado. Nobody but Oscar saw it happen, and he wasn't talking. So they looked at the downed trees and other similar damage and took an educated guess. Oscar didn't know, but he confidently guessed that nobody suggested that it might have been a monster as big as a house conjured up from a baby's dream that caused the damage. Surprisingly, Oscar and Simmy weren't the only ones injured. Mrs. Ingersoll from across the street had been cooking in her kitchen when the creature had knocked the tree down on their house. Part of the wall came down on her hand and broke three fingers. Oscar, however, was definitely the most injured survivor. He woke up in the hospital with bandages on his head and casts on his arm and leg. He told the cops that came to the interview that he couldn't remember what had happened although he could remember just fine. He just couldn't explain it in a way that wouldn't make him seem crazy. And they told him it had been a microburst. He asked the policeman about his wife. No one has seen her. Officer Rutledge responded. She wasn't in your home and hasn't shown up since either. We contacted your mother who drove out from Fresno to take care of your son. She was with me when all this happened. No one found her? Oscar pleaded. I'm sorry. Rutledge said, hanging his head slightly. They filled out a missing person report. Oscar was unable to write with his arm in a cast, so Officer Rutledge played scribe for him. 
Full name, Simrita Balasaraswathi Lopez, Oscar said. Can you spell that for me, please? replied Rutledge. And on they went. Oscar was sobbing long before they made it all the way through. He knew they wouldn't be finding her. She was chewed up inside a dream monster's belly and wouldn't be waking up disoriented in an alleyway downtown or something like that. And worse yet, there would never be any remains found either. They'd never have anything to bury. Simmy's parents, brother, and sisters would never have any satisfaction or closure as the head shrinkers like to babble on about these days. The only one who would have that closure would be Oscar, because he saw it happen. How the cops would explain her disappearance would be interesting to see. They didn't seem to be interested in investigating or pressing charges or whatever it was that they would do. Would they say that the microburst blew her out to sea or something? That seemed pretty improbable. After all, the ocean was miles west of their house. That's a pretty strong wind. Oscar supposed time would tell. He did think he might be in for more visits from the police eventually as Simi continued to refuse to turn up. When his mother came in with Trevin to visit him, he could do nothing but cry. His beautiful, sweet, innocent baby perched on his mother's hip was the cause of all this pain and destruction. It was as if he were a fuzzy little teddy bear robot, so cute and sweet, but within it there was a nuclear power cell that could become unstable and melt down and vaporize a bunch of people at any time. But, all the same, he couldn't look into that face and feel anything but love. He was his son the fruit of his loins. He would carry on his family name into the future. He would grow up to have so much more joy and happiness than Oscar had ever had in his lifetime, because Oscar had so much more prosperity to share with him than his own parents had had. But would he? Would he grow up at all? Would Oscar, now alone as his parent, be able to keep him safe, and the world safe from him, until he got old enough that he could do something about his dream problem? He cried as his mother placed the baby in the crook of his left arm so he could hug him. His mother squeezed in and hugged them both gently as he sobbed and whispered Simmy's name. She's gone, Mom, he said. She's just gone. Nobody knows where she is. She was with me when it happened, and now she's gone. They discharged him from the hospital that day, giving him and his mother instructions on how to care for his wounds. He slept in his room that night, in his empty bed, with Trevin in the crib. His mother slept in the guest room down the hall. "'What's with all the air horns everywhere?' she asked. Oscar didn't know quite how to respond to that. "'Trevin has bad dreams,' he said. "'And sometimes we use them to wake him up?' She frowned at that. Apparently, it wasn't a good answer, but Oscar just changed the subject. Trevin's true dreams happened every night after they got home from the hospital. They weren't physically destructive like the giant creature had been. Instead, they were emotionally destructive. Oscar kept waking up to find apparitions of Simi in their room. He always cried when he saw her, his heart aching for her to be real, his mind knowing that she was not. Each appearance was a dagger in his soul. Trevin was surely trying to work out her disappearance in his mind, not understanding why his mom never came to take care of him any more when he cried. It was hard for both of them, and Oscar couldn't decide who had it worse. His mom would come running when she heard the air horn, wondering what the hell was going on. She would find Oscar wallowing in uncontrollable tears and have nothing better to offer than a shoulder to cry on. Simmy's parents came out from New Jersey as soon as they could make it as well. It was so uncomfortable because he had nothing he could say to them. No one knew where she was, and that was the best explanation he had. Her mother who had always been so very sweet on him, looked at him with distrust and accusation. They took several trips to the police station while they were in town and always came back frustrated and angry. 
They never felt satisfied with anything the police said. How could she have gone missing because of a windstorm? At last, the time for them to leave arrived, and even though he'd always really liked her parents, he was ecstatic to see them go. Eventually, Oscar's injuries healed enough that he could take care of himself, and even his son as well, and his mother returned to Fresno too. She went with great trepidation. She had wanted at least to hear news of Simi before she left, but, of course, they never did. Oscar didn't know when they'd finally have a funeral for her, but he wasn't ready for it yet. And there was no rush, since there was no body and no news. He was glad to see his mother go. He loved her dearly and was very grateful for her help, but it had become very difficult to keep her in the dark about Trevin's gift. Or maybe curse was more appropriate. She was growing less and less satisfied with Oscar's lies when she asked him what was going on. And sooner or later, she would see something and he'd be unable to explain it away. Or worse yet, she'd see something and end up like Simi, dead and vanished into the ether. Once his mother was gone, Oscar got lazy and started using the TV as a babysitter. Despite his misgivings, he let Trevin watch Yo Gabba Gabba again, as well as whatever else came on the TV after that. He was too depressed to care. He knew he shouldn't allow it because it would only come back to haunt him, but he couldn't make himself care. After all, the kid was an American. He was going to see TV sooner or later, and a lot of it. There was no way around it. He soothed his conscience by telling himself he was just letting the inevitable happen. It didn't seem to make any difference either. Each night, instead of giant orange, one-eyed, cactus-like monsters, Simi appeared in his room and rubbed salt into the ever-widening wound. These new apparitions were so much more like the real thing, too. The eyes weren't off, and the mouth huge like the first apparition of Simi that had been so many weeks ago. These ones would have fooled even her own mother. Luckily, she had not witnessed any of them when she had been in town. Every morning, Oscar woke up feeling like he'd been run over by a car. He was getting so little sleep, what with his son pestering him with constant appearances of his wife's ghost. He cried for long stretches of the night after each one, but even when the tears had dried, he still couldn't manage to find the peaceful oblivion of sleep. Instead, he tossed and turned and stared at the ceiling. When he closed his eyes, his mind would replay the film of the giant monster plunging down on Simeon enveloping her. Once, he opened his eyes to escape that film, only to find her apparition standing in the room. He screamed and grabbed the air horn to blast it, only to find he didn't need to because his scream had been enough to wake Trevin. When morning came, Oscar would drag his aching, sleep-deprived body from the bed, dress for work, and take Trevin to be dropped off at the daycare center he'd found for him. It pained Oscar each time he left him there. Simi had been so very set against taking Trevin to daycare. They'd waited so long for a baby, and the last thing she wanted was for the baby to be raised by strangers, especially considering that Oscar made plenty of money for the both of them. Yes, she'd played cello in an orchestra and taught classes at San Francisco State, and those were very worthwhile and important endeavors, but to her, they paled in comparison to the awesome responsibility of raising a child. He deferred to her wishes, and Trevin had never spent a moment in anyone else's care. But she was gone now, and there was nothing else he could do. So he would dump him off on strangers every morning on his way to work, and pick him up again around eight hours later, never knowing what he experienced while they were apart. This did worry him because of his special gift. What new nightmares would he pick up from daycare? But he had to let it slide because he had no other choice. He was a single parent now, and the dice were just going to have to fall as they would. His ability to control those things had left him when that monster had descended on his wife and tore her from his life. It took a full month and a half after Simi's death before things started to settle down and fall into a predictable pattern again. 
Simi stopped her nightly appearances, instead opting for rare cameos that Oscar became more and more equipped to deal with and dispatch. Oscar grew out of his funk as well. When he was home in the evenings, he spent his time playing with Trevin instead of propping him up in front of the TV. God knew he'd seen enough Yo Gabba Gabba Adventure Time and SpongeBob SquarePants to create fearsome nightmares enough to kill, maim, and destroy everything in Northern California. But the pipeline was being shut down. Oscar knew he never should have opened it at all, but regardless, he could at least shut it down now before anything terrible happened. Unfortunately, he was too late. 10. Oscar had gotten in the habit of sitting on the porch and enjoying the sunset and the cool twilight breeze coming off the ocean each night after putting Trevin to bed. Simmy's death had made him old before his time, he figured. He wasn't even 40 yet, but he spent his evenings the same way his grandmother did. There was something about that time of the evening that brought him peace and quieted all the roiling thoughts in his head. He loved to just stare at the sky as the sun sank behind the houses and to watch the majestic oak tree across the street sway in the breeze. Sometimes he struck up a conversation with his neighbors if they stepped outside to roll their garbage cans to the curb for pickup or came home late from work. They all tiptoed around him, keeping the talk safely away from the events of the previous month that claimed the life of his wife. Despite that conversational wall between them, Oscar came to know his neighbors better than he ever had before. He learned of their likes and dislikes, struggles and triumphs, and strengths and weaknesses. On a Thursday night in April, Oscar put Trevin to bed and went down to sit on the porch. He took a glass of lemonade and a John Grisham novel with him. He sipped from one and read from the other, putting both down when a neighbor came by, so that he could chat for a moment or two. Mrs. Ingersoll, who had broken her fingers the day Simmy had died, came out with some pruning shears to clip some of the branches off the new plum tree she'd planted in her yard two years earlier. Pruning, huh? Oscar said. Yep, she replied. My book says that springtime is the right time to do it. Sounds reasonable, Oscar said. Is that a fruit tree or a shade tree? Well... She said, smiling and turning his way, setting the shears on the ground and leaning against them. It's not a lot of anything just yet, just a sapling, but it's meant to be a shade tree. It's a flowering plum or something like that. I can't remember exactly anymore. It won't make any fruit worth eating. Mrs. Ingersoll had always been the neighbor he'd had the hardest time chatting with. It wasn't because she was rude or closed-mouthed or any fault of hers at all. It was just that seeing her out there in her cast while her fingers healed never failed to make Oscar think of Simmy. It had gotten a lot easier when her three weeks were up and she'd had the cast removed. We used to have fruit trees, Mrs. Ingersoll continued, but we never got around to picking any of it. It would all fall on the ground and rot. It smelled bad and brought bugs and birds and stuff. It was just too much trouble, so we got rid of them and replaced them with... She suddenly cut off her monologue, eyes squinting as she looked at a spot in the air above Oscar. What in the world? Oscar sat up in his chair, and then, realizing what she must be seeing, bolted to his feet. What is it, Mrs. Ingersoll? He didn't need to hear her answer, though because a huge, spiny green snake-like object dropped from above him and landed, writhing on his lawn. It looked like a spiked cucumber, but it twisted and wiggled like a worm that has been poked by a stick. Mrs. Ingersoll screamed and ran for her door. Oscar turned to run for his own door when he saw another thing drop out of the sky onto his lawn. This looked like a long, misshapen dog with white fur, oddly long legs, and a large maw full of teeth. Damn it, Trevin, he thought. Why do you have such nightmares? Another thing came down from above the porch. This one just swooped in, then out of his sight. It was some sort of giant bird, or maybe even a pteranodon dinosaur. It didn't appear to have any feathers. As he stood, transfixed in horror, staring at what his son had wrought, another four of the cucumber snake things dropped to the lawn. They writhed on the ground, 
Then one of them rose into the air like a dragon, and he saw that it was some sort of dragon with wings and legs that ended in sharp-looking claws. Just no dragon's head. Its neck ended in a rounded-off nub like the end of a cucumber. Oh God, what are you doing, Trevin? he thought, and he turned to run inside. He had to get upstairs and get the boy awake before his dream managed to kill more people. He threw open his front door to find it blocked by the bulk of a huge, hairy blue monster. It looked like Oscar might be looking at the hindquarters of an elephant, a hairy one, a mammoth maybe? It was crammed into the entryway, more than filling every inch of it. The way was completely blocked. Oscar turned back to the porch, looking for something he could use as a prod. The best he could come up with was the patio chair he had been sitting on moments before. He grabbed it by the back, spun back around, and jabbed the mammoth in the backside with the chair legs as hard as he could. He heard a muffled roar that seemed to come from the creature's head on the other side of all that bulk, but it didn't move, not even an inch. The way was blocked, and it was going to stay that way. He had to find another way inside the house. He leaped over the porch railing, taking care to land as far from the thrashing cucumber snakes as he could. He heard a scream from across the road as he landed, and looked up to see Mrs. Ingersoll in the clutches of the cucumber dragon. The thing had wrapped itself around her like a boa constrictor, and was squeezing, driving the spikes that covered its body into her in dozens of places. Her scream turned into a gurgle and blood began gushing from her open mouth. Her body went slack as she died and was held aloft by the flapping of the cucumber dragon's wings. No! Not again, Trevin! How did you become so dangerous? You're killing people! Oscar ran full speed for the gate to the backyard. His leg ached where it had recently healed, but he ignored it, pushing through the pain. He couldn't spare a second for something insignificant like pain. Not when his neighbors were dying at the hands of Trevin's nightmares. He pulled the latch on the gate and dashed through. He could hear footsteps behind him as he ran. Footsteps and panting. That dog thing must be on my tail, he thought. It had to get in line. The backyard was as full of creatures as the front. Oscar dove and rolled as a dinosaur that looked like a cross between a Brachiosaurus and a Tyrannosaurus Rex took a swipe at him. Its enormous jaws snapped shut above him, and he heard the dog that had been trailing him yelp. As he came back out of his roll and popped back to his feet, he glanced over his shoulder and saw the dog's long legs dangling out of the dinosaur's mouth. Now he was at the back patio door. He threw it open and dashed in through the living room. The house was teeming with dream monsters. At the far end of the living room, Oscar saw the other end of the creature that had completely filled the entryway. It was a mammoth, a bright blue mammoth. Its bulky body stuffed into the tiny hallway so tightly that Oscar could see the walls cracking against the strain. Its legs were pinned underneath it, out of sight. That is, if it actually had legs at all. Considering that it came from the dreams of a child that still wasn't quite a year old, it possibly might not. He stepped over and around each unusual beast that blocked his path. There were more of the cucumber snakes thrashing blindly around the main floor, breaking holes in walls and crushing furniture. He pushed his way past the dining room table and a pile of what looked like living spaghetti noodles and mounted the stairs. He was only ten steps from Trevin's bedroom door when the cucumber dragon caught him by the leg. Its spines dug into his ankle and it pulled his foot out from under him. He screamed as he fell to his knees. He felt his shoe filling with blood as the thing slithered its way up his legs. The spines on its body digging deep furrows in his flesh as they went. He grabbed a plastic toy dump truck and smashed it down on the thing and cried out as the blow smashed the dragon's spines deeper into his leg, but then smiled as the thing went limp and released its grip. He shook his leg and the creature fell in a bloody heap on the carpeted steps. He winced, realizing that all the blood in that heap was his own, not the creature's. 
Then he noticed that one of the thing's spines was broken off and protruding from his leg right where he had bashed it with a toy. He grabbed hold of it and yanked it out. That was a big mistake. No sooner was the spine removed than a spray of blood began spurting from his leg so heavy it seemed as though someone had turned on a garden hose. He realized two things in that moment. One, the artery in his leg must have been cut. And two, he probably wasn't going to make it alive, even if he managed to get up there and wake Trevin. No one would be here in time to stop him from bleeding out. His life was coming to an end, just as Simmy's had, at the hands of his child's dream monsters. Just as Simmy's had, and also Mrs. Ingersoll's had. He would be the third death that could be attributed to his baby boy. And that might not be all, too. With the number of strange creatures filling the streets... For all he knew, there might be other casualties out there if any of his other neighbors had come out of their homes to see what was going on. All of this was happening in a sort of casual manner, too. The baby was doing it in his sleep, not even lifting a finger. He was a serial killer without even trying. What would happen after Oscar died and his son was taken to his mother's house to be cared for as his will specified they should do? Would his mother be able to figure out what was going on when this insanity started happening in her home? How long before some dream creature took his mother's life as well? From there, Trevin would probably go to Simmy's parents. Would he take their lives as well? And then what? Where would he go? And who would die because of it? He had thought of Trevin as being like an unstable nuke. And the comparison only seemed more apt now that Oscar's own life had been forfeited to Trevin's chaos. As Oscar turned to head up the stairs, brandishing the spine from the cucumber dragon and slipping in the puddles of his own life's blood, he understood what his course of action had to be. He had to put an end to this madness. He had to stab his baby with that spine. He had to kill Trevin. The minute his mind settled on this course of action, it rebelled against it. How could he kill Trevin? He was his son, his offspring. Fathers are supposed to do everything they can to help their children and keep them safe. He should be giving his life to save Trevin, not using the last seconds of his life to destroy him. Images of his son smiling, laughing, and playing flashed through his mind. He saw himself rocking Trevin to sleep, washing his hair in the bathtub, feeding him from one of those little bottles of pureed fruit, and he faltered on the top step of the stairs. He didn't want to do it. He simply couldn't do it. Then another cucumber dragon crashed into him, wrapping its lithe body around his torso and squeezing. Oh shit, he thought. I've waited too long. He felt the creature's spine sliding into his flesh, puncturing muscles and organs. Blood began to pour from dozens of holes in his flesh, and his vision started going hazy. He had already lost so much blood before this new danger arrived. He didn't feel like he would make it the four steps to Trevin's crib. Blood burst out of his mouth as the dragon squeezed tighter. Oscar stumbled to his knees, catching himself on the bars of the crib. Trevin lay there, mouth wrapped around a blue pacifier, breathing slowly and peacefully. None of the chaos around him had penetrated his world. Oscar's heart went out to him. I'm sorry, Trevin, he thought. I love you. With his last bit of strength, he hauled himself upwards, raised the spine over his head, and plunged it downward. Oscar fell to the carpet and came to rest in the enormous puddle of blood his body had pumped out the many holes in his flesh. The cucumber dragon that had been wrapped so tightly around his torso disappeared before he reached the ground, and Trevin's room slowly faded to black. everybody welcome back i see you haven't taken your own life yet so that's a positive they will (laughs) 
Yeah, this story's pretty dark, huh? Well, that's what you mentioned to me today. I, just today you got me the audio for the second half. And we were ambitious enough to be like, okay, send it to me today and we will record the second half today. Because we didn't want three months to go by between episodes. Yeah, I wanted it to be as quick as possible. That's why um, I only let one month go by. <laughs> <laughs> Last time we were actually together in the car recording the episode. Oh, that's right. And that feels like so, so long ago, which is weird because we're always talking about it. It's like, holy cow, Christmas is here again. Holy cow, the year is halfway over again. Holy cow, I'm at retirement age again. <laughs> it just seems like a long time since you and I saw each other. And uh, It does, yeah. It was, uh, I guess, uh, it's already a month and a half ago, though, so there is that. Oh, okay. And that's my uh, that's my speed, I guess. Sorry, everybody. I should have been more on the ball. Yeah, I, I hope that, uh, I hope you are eager for lots more apologies, because now <laughs> it's time to talk about Fireflies. Okay, uh, Big, you've read a lot of Stephen King and interviews with Stephen King. What is the question he hates to hear the most? Where do you get your ideas from, right? It's exactly it. He complains endlessly about that question. And, and I'm going to ask you, where did this idea come from? Um, I think we started to talk about it when we recorded last time around, and then I realized that I would give it away. I huh? edited you it had to edit out, that out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I was jogging one time. Oh, no. Jogging, you know, it's it's a really monotonous kind of uh, dull activity. You just run along. And I'm super slow, so you run along at a very slow pace. Uh, I was jogging along, and the Owl City song called Fireflies came on on my MP3 player. And I, I don't know that I can put an exact finger on what it was about the song the song is i mean there's the line where he says it's hard to say i'd rather stay awake when i'm asleep and then another time he says uh, something about his dreams i swear there's a line in there where is that he says everything is never as it seems but i thought that, that rhymes with dreams somewhere well do you have the lyrics in front of you I do, yeah, I'm reading them and I'm doing it. I'm not finding the word dream anywhere. <laughs> Maybe that was one of those misheard lyrics, you know? Like, I saw a whole book of that once. Some guy had made, like, one of those little coffee table books where he just took songs. Yeah, I, th I think it was called Excuse Me While I Kiss This Guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So maybe it was just one of those that I misheard or something, but I swear Dreams was part of the song. But anyways, somehow the idea of your dreams coming alive in the real world came to me by way of the lyrics of this song, Fireflies by Owl City. Then, you know, the rest of my jog home, I was kind of coming up with the idea of, you know, what, what would happen if that happened? You know, somebody's asleep and then their dreams come around in the real world. And then for some reason, and probably because I had a baby at the time, the idea of it being a baby that this happened to also came to me. And just how, you know, what do you do? There's no reasoning with a baby. You can't sit down and talk to him or, or try and figure out some way to work around the problem. I don't know. That just seemed really interesting to me. And I think I sat on that idea for a little while, like more than a year before I ever finally wrote the story. And I think you also wrote a story at the same time. If I remember right, we decided to do a blog a story thing event whatever you want to call it so on our blogs each day we just we wrote on our story and then we would post it that same day for people to read here's the next part of fireflies yeah i posted the story day by day and many of you listening might remember that story wonder why i picked this to depress you with again it's weird because i look back at this story and i remember it in such a positive light and then I listened to it, and I performed the story, and then I edited the story, and I just, by the time I was done editing, I was just like, man, this story is so dark. What was I thinking? Why did I write this story? It was a different me when I wrote this story. I want to say it was like 2013 
when I did this story in the first place. And I wouldn't be satisfied with this story anymore. Maybe it's because at one point I, I embraced the fact that I was that guy that wrote these stories that were, you know, like you used to joke and say, a very small pine box. Stories by Big Anklevich. That was supposed to be the name of my compilation. And I guess I embraced that more. And I think at a certain point, I thought, you know what? That's probably a turnoff for people. (laughs) They're not going to love that. And maybe I need to stop killing off main characters and people in such a merciless way at the end of all my stories. And yeah, these days I think I would come up with a different way to finish the story. I would find some way for them to fix it. I wouldn't be satisfied with this this downer of an ending. But yeah, it doesn't do me any good because I don't write anymore. I've, I guess I did write a little bit earlier this year, but I haven't since. Well, so. But you've been doing videos like crazy. That's true. And uh, maybe we put a link in the show notes to your videos in case people are not aware. If you like toy collecting, check out my videos. But, uh, you know, I was thinking today that there's only so much gas in the tank. I, I have all these ideas of things that I would like to do, and I, I want to put out my own short story collections and podcasts and audiobooks and videos and write, and I just I can't do all of those things. And so I need to pick something and say, okay, that's what I'm going to be doing right now. And I focus on that and see if I can get that one thing finished. And there, there's, there's not enough time in the day. There's not enough gas in the tank. There's not enough filling the blank in the blank. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, for a while when you wrote Fireflies, you were writing, I'm assuming, every single day. And uh, this was your live blog writing thing. But it's cyclical, you know? We have other things that we're doing. I mean, this podcast requires a commitment. And it's like, okay, that's what we're doing right now. We're focusing on this. And uh, the people that seem to do everything, I don't know how they pull it (laughs) off. Maybe they clone themselves like uh, Michael Keaton in Multiplicity. Yeah, or they just have a a team of Oompa Loompas behind the scenes that nobody knows about doing all sorts of stuff for them or something. We had Oompa Loompas once, and we pissed it all away. (laughs) But yeah, it's, it's totally true. There's only so much gas in the tank. And sometimes I wonder, when it comes to that, am I driving in the right direction? You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) am I using this gas that's in the tank in the best way possible? Or am I wasting the gas and I'm going to run out of gas and be in the middle of nowhere when I'm done? I've been thinking about that a lot recently, but that's a different conversation for a different time, I think. Well, but it's got to be something that everybody thinks about. Everybody, as you get older and you start to realize that there are fewer days ahead than there are behind, you start to question. (laughs) Did I take the right path? Yeah. How many of these decisions were bad ones? But I'm not sure that that is the best use of your mind because there's not a dang thing you can do about where you have been and how you got to where you are now. You can only go forward or make a turn and go a different direction, but you can't affect the past. And as far as, you know, you looking back on Fireflies, to bring it back to this story... No, the Big Anklevich of 2019 would not write this story exactly the way that he did. But the Big Anklevich of 2013, these were things that were on his mind. This is where the story took him, or he took the story, depending on what kind of writer you are. And what does it say about you? The things that you were afraid of in 2013, the solution to the questions that are asked in this story in 2013. There there was a part in the story that really freaked you out while you were narrating. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about that and why does it scare you? 
Yeah, it was funny because I had completely forgotten about this part. It's not a part that I remember from the story uh, when I wrote it. You know, there's certain parts like the, uh, rescuing the baby from the Muno monster that, that happens. I remember that well. The big finale when just everything goes crazy and there's the cucumber dragon and the giant mammoth thing that's crammed in the entryway so tight that it can't move and all of that kind of stuff I remember and the giant fish sea creature thing that eats Simi in there I totally remember that part but the part there was one part where he wakes up and his wife is there looking at him and he's like what what's going on then after a while he realizes it's not really her it's one of these dream creatures the true dreams as uh, I sometimes called them and to me that was just so freaky to imagine waking up in bed and you know he was still kind of groggy and not knowing what's going on and there's your wife and she's looking at you and you're like what she doesn't respond she's just staring what what and then you get a closer look and she's not right. There's something really off. Her eyes are, aren't the same. They're too big or they're too far apart and the mouth is weird. And oh my gosh, there was something about that that was just so creepy that just made me kind of shiver <laughs> as I was reading it. I was just like, Ugh. <laughs> this is the moment that got me the most was the small kind of quiet moment of the of the many things that happened. It's really affecting. And uh, I mean, obviously, the thing that you're the things that you're afraid of, and the things that I'm afraid of aren't exactly the same. But every once in a while, they will align perfectly. And it's much harder for me to relate to that than for you, because I'm not used to having somebody in the bed. Right. If I have somebody in the bed with me, it is a, a rare occurrence. <laughs> and yet... It is a red letter day. Mm. A coup d'etat, to coin the Norman phrase. Stop it. <laughs> Don't shine too bright a light on <laughs> that statement, folks. But it seems to me that if you are married or, you know, if, you, if you've got somebody that's always there, that, that you're used to it, that that is the status quo that you are more able to sleep with someone there than without someone there and you have a trust a comfort zone of that person is there and that it is somebody else in that place is a real violation of that trust of that comfort yeah. zone in an awful way the, the, only, the, the best way that I can relate to it is that moment in the effed up stop motion animation flick the Coraline movie where the little girl is talking to who she thinks is her mother and the woman turns and it's not her mother it's it only looks like her mother remember she's got the button eyes kind of thing right. that that is terrifying universally you know what i mean where you trust somebody they are always there you're vulnerable and then that's not them and I, I feel like that scene in Fireflies is really cinematic. Two or three directors would do it two or three different ways. You could do it in a subtle way where he doesn't realize it immediately. But it's sort of a slow, dawning horror of why are her eyes... Who is that? What is that? Kind of thing. Or you can do it in, you know, the, what is most popular today of just the, the scream, jump scare of he looks over he assumes it's her it's not kind of thing or 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 you could let the audience know that it is not her but he doesn't know yet he doesn't realize yet and and the thing is she's not malevolent not like the monsters that appear before and after this is just somehow how the baby sees his mother or the baby's fantasy version of his mother kind of thing. You know what I mean? I don't think he sees his mother as a threat in the same way that he sees these creatures on the, the television as a threat. But it's still horrible knowing that that is in your bed, that, that you caressed that or it wants to caress you. So, so yeah, well done 
on that, I, I, I feel like that's a, a scare that truly works. <laughs> I don't know what it was about it, but it was the thing that uh, messed me up the most. Uh, or messed me, I don't know if that's the right word for it. But it was the thing that, you know, gave me actual shivers. And, and this was me reading. It's weird when that happens with your own story. You know what I mean? Like, I should know that. There shouldn't be anything surprising about it. At the very least, I should see it coming or something like that. You know what I mean? Because I wrote it. You know, I mean, you've talked a lot of times about how you found some story you wrote eight years ago and you have no memory of writing it and stuff. And you read through it and you still don't remember it at all. Uh, so I guess it's not that strange, but... But it's uh, weird, the things that we remember and the things that we don't. Like if I said to you, sing me the theme song to The Muppet Show... You could do it immediately. Although I think you watched The Muppet Show in the last 25 years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sing me true. the theme song to... Sing me the, uh, the Big Mac jingle. You know, the McDonald's. Uh -huh. What is in a Big Mac? And you can do it immediately without even thinking about it. But then I go, okay, who's your fourth grade teacher? And you go, oh, that... Uh, wait. Or what did you have for dinner last night? Or uh, <laughs> who is in the big sleep you know something like that where you're like i saw that movie i i don't know why we remember certain things vividly and don't remember things we, we, we talked about it before it was like you cram for a test you have to know these things they're important to you and you cannot keep them in your head they 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 slip through your fingers like I don't know, something through like a sieve. Star systems. Like so many star systems like, slip through yeah, your fingers. Yeah, slipping through Grand Moff Tarkin's fingers. <laughs> and I don't know why the brain works that way. But part of it might be, with, in, in our case, that we use a different part of our brain to create than we do to read or to edit. And wherever I go... To write that story, it's not the same part of my brain when I pick up this story and look at it. And you, you have no excuse at all because you wrote it. I'm assuming you rewrote it. Then you recorded it. And it wasn't until you were editing the audio. But I think it had to do with just that it was so long since, you know, the, the last time that I had taken a look at this story that I had forgotten a lot of the details and that kind of stuff. And uh, it was creepy. But yeah, it's funny because uh, I haven't mentioned him in a long time, but old Dean Wesley Smith talked about that all the time, you know, that when you write, you're in that creative part of your mind. And the creative part of your mind is like an instinctual kind of a thing. It knows a good story and it can just tell a good story. And then when you go back and you edit and do those other things, you're out of the creative part and you're into your crit critical part, which will pick at things. And, you know, there's, there's nothing particularly original about your critical part. You know, your critical part of your mind will remove the original stuff from your story if you let it. And, uh, yeah, he talks about not doing too much editing on any story that you do because it'll remove the voice of your creative mind and make your story sound just like anybody else's story. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know how much I agree with that as far as the way that you and I write. But it's definitely the case when somebody has grown or developed or changed and there is a great deal of time in between. I mean, George Lucas is a great example. Steven Spielberg, you know, go going through E.T. and saying, okay, I'm going to change this, I'm going to change that because my perception of what is okay and what is not uh, has changed. That stuff is, it's, it's damaging. You, you lose the person that made that film. Right. I mean, in George Lucas's case, so many people have said, you know, that's not your movie anymore. You released that movie and we loved it. And here you are all these years later tinkering with it and you're still not done tinkering with it. It's not your movie anymore. And whether you agree with that or not, you're not the person that you were when you told that story. And that is bound to influence certain things. I remember 
Spielberg saying that if he made Close Encounters of the Third Kind when he was older, he, luckily he made it when he was in his 20s, but if he had made it once he was a father and a husband, he wouldn't have had Roy Neary go off and, and leave his family and pursue this, this obsession and go up in the, st the starship at the end. Because it was, it's too irresponsible. It's, it's, what about your family? What about your responsibilities? What kind of man are you? What kind of hero is this? And he actually, Spielberg becomes emotional about it. That he's like, I can't believe that I wrote a movie like that, where we portray this deadbeat dad as the hero. But in 1977, that wasn't who Spielberg was. There was nothing irresponsible about that. That's revisionist history. That's not taking context into account. And it's, you know, it, it's good that that 20-something Steven Spielberg made that movie. Now he's an old man and he has other stories that he wants to tell. And same thing with you. Maybe not so much the old man part, but you would not write Fireflies the way that you wrote it today. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that I would. I think that but I would. But you shouldn't feel ashamed of the story that you wrote at that time or who you were at that time or where the story took you. Because I don't know how much control you have over where these stories go. And yes, your collection, uh, by the way, was a very small coffin, uh, not, <laughs> not kind box. In a way, that's liberating that you allow yourself to go there. Not only does Oscar lose his wife and his neighbor and his own life to his child, but he sacrifices his child at the end. I, I feel like very few writers would go there because it's a very dark place to go and it's not popular to go there. It's, it's, it's unsettling. It makes people think, it makes people feel something other than, you know, the way you feel when Free Willy jumps free into the ocean at the end of that movie. I, I'm not going to say that I envy you, your brutality or your mean streak, but in some ways it's, it's, it's super liberating. You know, one of my absolute favorite TV shows is The Twilight Zone. From 1959 to the early 60s, Rod Serling would write these stories or produce these episodes that would upset people. They would make people think that everything was going to work out fine, and then it wouldn't. And here we are 60 years later, and it's still powerful today. It was brave. It was bold. And in some ways, it was unpopular in the 1960s that he did this thing. It was seen as not commercially smart. So I guess I'm just saying that it takes a certain kind of boldness to let yourself go to a place there like that. Yeah, I guess so. I think that the real problem is you have to temper it. You know what I mean? Going there every time <laughs> is going to eventually just lose you your audience. You know what I mean? Like sooner or later, people are going to be, oh, it's that guy again. No, I'm not going to read his story because... I just want to kill myself every time I get to the end of one of his stories. <sighs> it was hard to not kill myself last time. I don't want to be, <laughs> be successful this time around, so I'm just going to skip his stuff. It was hard to not kill myself. <laughs> At a certain point. Well, okay, but th then, yes, I mean, you can grow as a creative person in the same way that Dean Wesley Smith would tell you to. By saying, okay, the next project that I write, when I am tempted to let despair reign, I'm going to stop and I'm going to find a way to beat it, to beat the unhappy ending. But I'm, I'm sure he would agree with me that it's not good to say, okay, we're going to go back and fix that ending. Oh, we're yeah. going to fix that. Fireflies is done. Fireflies is out there. It's you can't take it back. It's escaped. Yes, it most definitely is, and I wouldn't even consider it. And so, if you feel like you are pigeonholed as the unhappy ending guy, then <laughs> the next one, just work on it. See if you can overcome. See if you can allow your characters to overcome to somehow beat the odds. And in that way, you have an advantage in that your audience. <laughs> 
expects them to fail. Yeah, see, that's the thing that I was going to say. I think is funny is that, yeah, people, when I have a happy ending, are pleasantly surprised. They're like, oh, wow, you mean the monster didn't eat them? Uh, and, they'll, and they'll be, like, all happy and, and like, more happy than, than a regular person would be after having read a story. It'll be, like, doubly good for them. So, of course, that effect will only last so long, you know. Pretty soon they'll be like, oh, he's just stopped with the dark endings. That's the difference. He's gone soft. What a wuss. I'm not reading that guy anymore. (laughs) Okay, yes, you can go too far in the other direction. I guess the trick is to just vary it back and forth, whether you intentionally do that or whether you just allow the story to take you. And, And every once in a while, you've had it happen, a story surprises you. And you'll say, wow, I did not expect them to get out of that. But they did. They got out. That's just kind of the magic of being a creative person is sometimes you've no idea how it's going to end. It's as much of a surprise to you as it was to the audience. Yeah, and it it sometimes depends, too, on how big... You know, I've always written short stories. And this one, I guess, doesn't really count as short. Uh, It's almost 17,000 words, which I think that makes it a novelette. I don't remember where the cutoff is for the various different names, but this one's a pretty, pretty long for a short story. I mean, it took us two episodes to get the whole thing out. And I remember Stephen King talking about writing Misery. And I think originally Misery had a name like the something something special edition or something like that where basically this writer who writes these stories kills off the character and then a crazy fan happens upon him when he's in a car accident brings him back to her house forces him to write a new story where the character comes back then at the end we find out that the, the person has like butchered this author and used his skin as the leather on the special leather-bound book that he wrote. That was, I think, Stephen King's original ending for Misery. But he started writing it, and the character was surprisingly resilient and found ways to uh, combat this crazy person. And after a while, he got to like the character so much that he's like, you know what? I can't do that ending anymore. It's gone from being a short story to a novel. And once you get to a novel, you can't just turn your character into the leather-bound book. People just won't stand for that anymore. And he had to find a happy ending for the story instead. And as time gone by, I've written less and less short things and more and more longer things. I think that might have something to do with it, too. One of the comments I was just looking back at when I live blogged the story, I think it was Tina that wrote, uh, she was upset after Simi died. And instead of bringing her back in the next chapter or something like that, you know, he just had to deal with the fact that she was dead. And her comment was just like, oh, you're killing me with this. I don't want Simi to be dead. And (laughs) at the time I commented and said, yeah... I feel the same way. Uh, I grew to really like the character and I didn't want this to happen when it finally came time for it to happen. But, you know, that was what happened in the story. It was in my head already, you know. I I had the plan there. And uh, instead of forcing myself to come up with something else, I went through with the plan. Yeah, it was sad for me for her to die too, which is kind of funny. Well, do you have any other questions that you would like to ask? I, I don't think so. I, I, I know that tonight's episode had to be a little shorter. I was going to ask you about the, the title, because as I was listening to it, from time to time, I would hear something that sounded like, oh, well, that, that would have been a good title for this. But it's just the song was the inspiration and you chose to name the story after yeah the song was the inspiration and that was the first vision whatever that they had i thought and there's an outtake that you'll hear after we're done where (laughs) i come across the line true dreams uh used several times and i just thought oh man that would be a really good title for this story except for the fact that that would give away i think 
what is going on here. And for the first large portion of the story, and at least the first half of the story, they don't know what's going on. It's kind of a mystery, and they're trying to figure it out. And if you telegraph that too early, then that ruins it. Something else might have been more appropriate, but I didn't want to ruin stuff with the title, which seemed pretty easy to do. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I I would be curious to hear what people thought of the ending of the story. Yeah. Is it too dark? Does it depress you too much? Should I not have gone there? Uh, I wasn't trying to say anything <laughs> per se with the story. It was just, you know, I guess the moral of the story is you do what you got to do, I guess. <laughs> it is what it is. I think that's one of those phrases that people hate because it's so self-evident but uh this was their lot in life and they just had to do what they had to do to to fix things it's dark in so many ways you know what i mean like it ends badly but not only does it end badly but the oscar has to kill his own son which you know despite all the trouble that he caused he also brought them so much joy and made them so happy he was so cute and so you know, perfect and what they'd always dreamed of. Yeah, it was just, are you able to kill your darlings, as they say in the uh, writing (laughs) platitude? You know, I don't know. It's just, it's really rough that, that that's what has to happen. And he has to do that because, you know, down the line, worse things will happen if he doesn't. So it's just, it's so dark. (laughs) Well, who knows, maybe one day you will revisit this story, but like turn it into a novel. If one day you became a novelist and you wrote all the time. And I pulled a, a Lost Boys. What would happen as the boy got older? What For a moment there, when, when Oscar's mother was in the house and Simi's uh, phantasm version kept popping up, I was afraid that Oscar's mother was going to see the ghost Simi, the the dream Simi. And I was just like, oh no, will that make things worse? Will that make, how will, and it, and you didn't go that way. But there's a bunch of places where you could expand and you could have Oscar stay his hand and, and, and maybe not be fatally wounded or, or have that happen later when the boy is five or old enough, you know, that he can go off and live with his grandparents or, or, or something. I it just, I, we've talked lots of times about you write a short story and is it enough for a novel? Is, is this best as a short story? Would it be better longer? Would it be better shorter? The idea is interesting enough of the, the dreams becoming reality that, uh, I feel like, uh, you could revisit this if you wanted to funny because you sent me once <laughs> like an, an article talking like, apparently there's some kind of horror film that came out a few years I think it's several years after I wrote this story where they basically have the same premise and I can't remember what the movie was even called but uh, yeah it was it was a similar thing people's nightmares manifesting in the real world and I, I never did watch that movie and I probably never will I'll be like uh, Thomas Harris and just avoid (laughs) so that it doesn't ruin my own mental image of the stuff from my story or something. But um, but yeah, it is it is an an interesting concept and I think it could it could be made into something bigger. I could do like Will McIntosh and do a a burning midnight novel version of the uh, of the story. Of course, I've got so many stories in my head that I haven't written still that going back and rewriting a different version of a story probably never happened considering how much I write. But, uh, maybe that needs to change. Seeing the... Uh, I, I looked at the comments and stuff from when I live blogged the story and just people talking about how they're reading it as I was going along and that they wanted me to hurry up and write the next part because I left them on a cliffhanger and mm. stuff like that. It was just... It makes me want to do it again. It makes me want to start right now. It makes me want to end this episode and start live blogging another story. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but let's definitely end the episode. 
Okay. Well, yeah, we'll we'll meet halfway and and we'll we'll just go with that. We'll just end the episode. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for sharing that story with me and with the audience and for sitting down and doing another Dune Steef episode. And it's not the last one. We've got another one uh coming soon. That's right. And this is not going to be the last one you're going to hear of my story too. My plan is to keep doing my stories on the Dune Steef. So now that I've done with this one, I'm going to pick another one and I'm going to record it and we'll have, we'll have another episode on top of the other episode that's already on its way. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you uh, found some enjoyment in this. And uh, we'll see you again next time around when we come back again. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Pleasant dreams. See ya. At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. From the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine team, good night. Take two. Six. Man, I can't believe I had to do a whole recording just to say the word six, all because I don't know how to read Roman numerals. (sighs) What is it? he asked. She didn't answer. She just stood up straight and continued looking at him. As the sleep dropped away from him. Oh, creepy. <laughs> Ooh, this bit gives me the creeps. He slid away from it on the bed and his hand. Then his butt. Oh, that should be butt with two T's. It was enough to ruffle its hair. Oh, (laughs) It was... (laughs) The air horn thing worked pretty well for them. Siri? (laughs) Not Siri. Her name is Simmy. They were no closer to understanding what triggered the true dreams. True Dreams. I wonder if I should change this title to True Dreams. Does that give it away too much? Yet, the ability to create monsters out of the ether while he slept, damn it. Yet, the ability to create monsters out of the ether while he slept was already present and accounted for. The availability, no, the avail... The ability to terrorize his parents with the vomit his subconscious spewed forth in the form of dreams. Damn it. <laughs> Mr. Flowery Language, f*** you. Oscar and Simmy couldn't help but laugh out loud each time Trevin pointed, made a big O shape with his mouth, and loudly shouted, Whoa! That's the worst baby sound ever. <laughs> he moathed, moathed. <laughs> he moaned and and I can't I can't say it while I'm laughing. And brought another tree crashing to the ground with a flailing flipper. Let's see if I can say that in a little less comic sounding. Simrita Balasaraswari Aswathi. Balasaraswathi. <laughs> I made it too hard for me to say. It was as if he were a fuzzy little teddy bear robot, so cute and sweet. But within it, there was a nuclear power cell that could become unstable and melt down and vaporize a bunch of people. That's a weird metaphor. (laughs) Who wrote this shit? Oscar didn't know when they'd finally have a funeral for her, but he wasn't ready for it yet. And there was no rush, since there was nobody. Oh, 
and there was no rush, since there was no body and no news. Simi had been so very set against taking Triven, Triven, and Simi. That not only does, what's his name, main character? Oscar. Not only does Oscar, uh, what, for a moment there when, when. Simi? No, what's his death? Oscar? When Oscar's mother was in the His ability to control those things had left him when that monster descended on his wife and tore her from his life. Descended on his wife and tore her from his life. It took a full month and a half after Simi's death. Okay, we'll stop. And then, realizing what she must be seeing, bolted to his feet. What is it, Mrs. Ingersoll? There's a bug flying right in your face. Its spines dug into his ankle and it pulled his foot from it. And it pulled his... And it... And it... And it pulled his foot out from under him. For all he knew, there might be other casualties out there. Damn it. My ass hurts really bad. I gotta stop sitting on this chair. He had thought of Trevin. He had thought of Trevin as being like an unstable nuke. And the compar and the comparison oh, goodness gracious, I need to go to bed or something. I can't say anything. And Trevin's room slowly faded to black. Life it seems will fade away. Drifting further every day. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.